Hi everyone, this is the video for chapter 3. In this chapter we're going to look at the relationships between categorical variables and we're going to do this by analyzing contingency tables. So this is an example of a contingency table um, and it shows two variables. We have voter opinion which in this case has three groups, which would be oppose, favor, and undecided. And then we have um, the other variable, the second variable, which is voter intentions, which is either likely to vote or unlikely to vote. So one of the first things that we want to do when we have a contingency table is finding the totals for the columns and the rows. In this table, it's done for us, but we will do an example where we have to find the totals first. Um, notice we have a grand total here of 1,620. So that's the size of the sample that this table represents. So in the example here, it says a random sample of 1,620 voters were asked their opinion on an amendment and their voting intentions. The table above displays the results. So um, when we look at contingency tables, one of the first things we want to do is figure out some percents and just get used to reading the table. So for part A, it says what percent of voters favor the amendment? So um, what we're going to do is we're going to create a fraction. And one of the most difficult things is to figure out the denominator in your fraction. And I always do this first. Um, and it's going to be based on the the total, which is always what they're going to ask first. So this is what percent of voters, what percent of voters. That means that the total number of voters is the denominator. So I know that when I am doing this, I'm going to have some value over 620. And then the question is, of these 1,620 voters, um, how many of them favor the amendment? That's our numerator. So in this case, we have a total of 608 that favor the amendment. So this fraction would be 608 divided by 1,620, which will give us 0 0.3753. That's the proportion. This is specifically asking for a percent, so I'm going to convert this by moving the decimal place over two spots, and we will get... 37.5% or about that. Uh, for part B, it says what percent of voters, again, I'm looking at all voters, so I know right away that the denominator is 1620. What percent of voters are likely to vote? Well, now I'm looking at the row likely to vote, and I see that there are a total of 933 that are likely to vote. 933 divided by 1620 um, gives me a proportion of 0 0.5759, um, and rounded this will give me about 57.6%. For part C, again it says what percent of voters, so I know I'm looking at the total, what percent of voters favor the amendment and are likely to vote. So whenever you see this and, that's going to be a single cell. So we're looking at the percent of voters that favor the amendment and are likely to vote. So that's this small group of people here. So we would have 452 divided by 1,620. And that is going to give us a proportion of 0 0.279, which gives us... Um, I don't know why I paused there, 27.9%. All right, so this is just, again, getting used to reading the table. Marginal distributions. So when you're looking at a marginal distribution, you're going to look at the totals within the margins. So we have two margins here. We can find a marginal distribution for voting intentions, or this margin here which would be the marginal distribution for voter opinion. Whenever you find a marginal distribution, you're going to use the totals divided by this grand total of the number of voters. So 
if I'm looking at the marginal distribution of voter intention, voting intentions, then I have two categories. I have likely to vote and unlikely to vote. With the likely to vote, um, in my margin, I can see that I have a total of 933 out of the 1620. And for unlikely to vote, I have a total of 687 out of the grand total of 1620. And we can convert both of these to a percent. So I get 57.6% and 42.4%. I want you to notice that if you were to add these percents together, they're going to give you a total of 100%. This will happen every time that you do a, either a marginal distribution or a, con, a conditional distribution, which we'll do on the next page. But I want you to see that they add to 100% and I'm using the same denominator for both fractions. That will also always be the case. So let's find the other marginal distribution, which in this case is for voter opinion. So now I have three groups. I have oppose, favor, and undecided. And I'm just going to use the totals for each of those groups over the grand total of 1620. So I have 581 that oppose. 608 that favor, and 431 that are undecided. And then I'm going to convert these to percents. And again, notice that all of the denominators are the same. And when I convert these, you're going to see that they add to 100%. Okay, so those are marginal distributions. Conditional distributions. So we're going to talk more about like things like conditional probability in Unit 2, but a conditional distribution means that we're still looking at the distribution of a variable, but for only one group of the other variable. So for example, um, say I wanted to and I'm, I'm looking here, say I wanted to calculate the conditional distribution of voter opinion for voters that are likely to vote. So I'm looking at voter opinion, which is the opposed, favor, and undecided, but I only want to look at the um, people that are likely to vote, which means that I'm only now looking at this one row of the table. And so the distribution then has a different total. I'm not talking about the grand total. I'm not talking about all voters. I only am looking at the voters who are likely to vote. So when I calculate this distribution, I'll take each cell and divide by the total in that row. Um, by the way, notice that I'm not even remotely trying to reduce these fractions. Do not reduce your fractions. Use the values that are in the table. That's how I'm showing my work. Um, and then I round when I get to the percent part. So if, um, if I write these as percent, this will be 40.3%. This will be 48.4%. And this will be 11.3%. Again, notice that if I add these percents together, I'll get 100%. And I use the same denominator for every fraction. Um, so let's do another example of conditional distributions, because this is the one that most people get incorrect when they're doing these problems. So for this problem, it says, what is the conditional distribution of voting intentions for those who oppose the amendment? So I want to find the distribution of voting intentions. So that is the likely to vote or unlikely to vote. But I'm only looking at people who oppose the amendment, which means I'm only looking at this column. 
That is my new subgroup that I'm looking at. The distribution for this subgroup, so I'll have the likely to vote and unlikely to vote. But now I have a different denominator. So uh, for the likely to vote, I have 376 out of the 581 people that oppose. And the unlikely to vote would be 205 out of the 581. And when we convert these to percents, I get 64.7% and 35%. 0.3%. Again, I don't want to sound like a broken record on this, but it's really important that you notice that, again, I use the same denominator for each fraction, and my fractions will add to 100%. It's just a way to check your work. Okay, so um, I wanted to show you how we can display marginal and condistri conditional distributions because this will be important in the next topic in this chapter, which is independence. So uh, looking at this first graph, I have the marginal distribution for voting intentions. So of all the voters, 58%, according to my table, were likely to vote and 42% were unlikely to vote. Now. If I then look at the conditional distribution for um, each voter opinion on voting intentions, so now I'm looking at, if I look at those people who oppose, I've got 65% who are likely to vote and 35% who are unlikely. Whereas for favor, I've got 74 who are likely to vote and 26 who are unlikely. And then for undecided, 24% um, are likely to vote, and 76% are unlikely to vote. Now, the reason that we're looking at this is because we want to talk about independence. Independence is a huge topic, and the concept is a little bit tricky. But basically, two variables are independent if one variable does not affect the other one. And we would say they're independent. The way that we look at this is we look at the marginal distribution for one variable, and then we look at the conditional distribution um, using the other variable and see if there's a difference. So I'm looking again at voting intentions. Again, this likely to vote versus unlikely to vote. As a whole, the, um, the ratio was 58% to 42%. If these were independent, then that same ratio would hold for each subgroup in the other variable, the voter opinion category. So oppose should have 58 to 42 percent, same with favor and same with undecided. That would be, that would show that they were independent. But because these values are different, um, specifically looking at undecided, look at how very different that ratio is, um, I can then say that these are not independent. Um, I think a lot of people think it sounds weird to say that two variables are not independent. Um, some people do use the term that they are dependent. Uh, I honestly don't like that. I'm not going to count it wrong though. Um, but I would say that the two variables are not independent. The other thing you can say is that there's an association between the variables. So association is the opposite of independence. Two variables are independent if they don't affect each other. Two variables have an association if they do. So we would say that voting intentions and voter opinion seem to have an association. We'll talk more about what that association is in chapter seven. Actually, no, we won't because we'll only do that for uh, quantitative variables. I apologize, but we will talk about um, association in chapter seven for uh, quantitative variables. All right, so let's bring this all together and do kind of one great big example. And this is the kind of problem that you'll see in your homework and that you'll see on an exam.
So we have a survey of automobiles parked in student and staff lots at a large university classified the brands by country of origin as seen in the table. So again, the very first thing that we normally have to do is find our totals. Um, so I did this ahead of time so you wouldn't have to watch me do all this addition, but if we add these together, we get uh, 212 here, 45 here, and 102. Um, and then along for driver, we've got a total of 195 students and 164 staff. Both of these will give me a grand total of 359. Um, I always kind of double check. So I'll add 212, 45, and 102 to get the 359. And I'll add 195 and 164 to make sure I get 359 again, just to make sure that I've done all my addition correctly. Okay, part A. What percent of cars surveyed are foreign? So what percent of cars? We had a total of 359 cars. So I know that the denominator is 359. Um, but it's asking a little bit more of a generality here when it says um, we're foreign. So that would include both European and Asian. So I have 45 European cars in total and 102 Asian cars in total. So if I add those together, I should have the total number of foreign cars out of the total number of cars. Um, when you put this in your calculator, you don't have to do it separately. I just throw parentheses in the numerator, and you'll get 0 0.409, which would be 40.9%. For part B, it says, what percent of American cars are owned by students? So I'm not talking about all the cars. I'm only talking about the American cars. And so I have a total of 212 American cars. Of those 212 American cars, how many are owned by students? That would be 107. Putting that in the calculator, we'll get 50.5%. Part C says, what percent of students own American cars? Again, I'm not talking about all the cars. I'm only talking about the students. So um, I have a total number of 195 students. Of those 195 students, how many own American cars? Well, this is 107 again. And this would be 54.9%. I want you to look at B and C because a lot of people will get these mixed up and that's why I chose both of these as examples. Make sure that you de determine your denominator first because in both of these, the numerator was the same. So it's the denominator that's the key to the problem. So in part B, it's only asking about the American cars. So that's how I know I'm using a total of 212. For part C, it's only asking about students, and that's why I know that my total is a 195. Part D says, what percent of cars were of Asian origin and driven by students? So Asian origin, sorry, what percent of cars? So I know that I'm t looking at all the cars again. So all the cars would be 359. And then I'm looking at those that fill the category of Asian origin and students. So Asian origin and students is 55. And when we put that in the, ca in the calculator, we get 15.3%. All right, so let's keep going with this, um, with this uh, example. Um, and we're going to look at marginal and conditional distributions. So part E here is specifically asking for the marginal distribution of vehicle origin. So 
that would be this margin here. So we have American, European, and Asian. The total of American is 212 out of the 359, which when written as a percent gives me 59.1%. The total European is 45 out of the 359, and that is 12.5%. And then we have 102 Asian out of the total 359, which is 28.4%. For part F, it says find the conditional distribution percentages of vehicle origin for staff. So now I'm looking at vehicle origin again. So I'm looking at American, European, and Asian, but I only want to look at the staff column. So I have a new, a new um, total here. I'm only looking at the 164 for staff. So again, we have American, European, and Asian. But for staff, we had 105 out of the 164 total, which was 64%. For European, it's 12 out of the 164, which is 7.3%. And for the Asian, it's 47 out of 164, which is 28.7%. Again, notice for both of these, for each distribution, the denominator is the same, and I check my work by adding everything up and making sure that I get 100% for each one. All right, part G. Do you think that vehicle origin is independent of driver? So if they were independent, then the distribution, the marginal distribution, would be the same as the conditional distribution. They're close, they're not that far off, but they're still pretty different. So I would say something like, if I were to hone in, um, a staff member is more likely to own an American car. Um, than the overall sample of drivers. Right? So a staff member is 64% likely to own an American car, whereas overall it was 59.1% um, of the sample um, of drivers had American cars. So we would say, therefore, that the variables are not independent. Um, and we could even say maybe something like um, there appears to be a small association between um, the driver and um, vehicle origin. Okay, that is all of chapter three. Let me know if you have any questions.